I want to speak a message today that I've entitled The Great Delusion. The Great Delusion. If I could have you open your Bibles to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start in the 18th verse. And the scriptures, they read this way. They brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting. With an appeal to twisted sexual desires, they lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world, by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and to reject the command they were given to live a holy life. In 1989, there was a woman by the name of Credonia Morindi. And Credonia Morindi started this movement that her and her followers believed was following the, the scriptures. What she actually taught was the teachings of Mary, the mother of Jesus, whom she claimed she received by visions. Now, Morindi, she was a powerful speaker. She was an authoritative speaker. She was an influential speaker. And what resulted was that the movement grew to about 4,000 people. Now, Morindi, she spent a lot of time preaching on prophecy, on end times and the apocalypse. And what she actually taught was that December 31st, 1999 was the last day on earth. She believed and she taught that on December 31st, that the Lord was going to return, take His church, and judge the world. So as December 31st approached, her followers began to sell all their possessions, sold everything that they owned, took all the money, and gave it to the church in hopes that if they gave enough money, that it would secure their salvation. Well, December 31st came and went, and Jesus didn't return. And so January 1st, some people started to question this teaching. And they began to go to Merindi and they asked her, they said, we want our possessions back. We want our money back that we gave the church. And instead of Merindi giving the money back, she instead labeled them as apostates and unbelievers and decided that all apostates and unbelievers needed to be destroyed and removed. So what ensued was a mass murder. She began killing everyone who she deemed as an apostate and an unbeliever. It ended up climaxing with one night there was a church service. They were all inside worshiping and Merindi demanded that the leadership of the church surround the church with barrels of gasoline and light it on fire. That night they burned the church down and 590 people lost their lives. All in total... Because of this movement, thousands of people lost their lives because they followed what they thought was the truth, but in actuality was nothing more than a great delusion. They thought, how could this woman stand here and speak with such authority, speak with such power, have such influence, and lead us astray? But they were all being led to believe a lie. In today's text, Peter, he writes this letter to the church and he identifies this false teaching and these false teachers. Now, when you begin to do a little bit of research, what you're going to understand is that Peter is actually dress, addressing a very specific belief system called Gnosticism. Now, I'm not going to get into the full uh, belief system of the Gnostics, but one particular thing they believed was that when you gave your heart to the Lord, your entire spirit was now cleansed. Your entire spirit was pure, but your flesh was still evil. So what they taught was you didn't strive for righteousness because your flesh was evil, so just let it do evil. What resulted was that the followers felt this incredible sense of freedom. 
They felt so free and so liberated because, quite frankly, they felt no shame for sin anymore. They felt no guilt for sin. None of it mattered. Your body was sinful, so let her be sinful. Peter addressed this as a false teaching. And in fact, in the whole chapter of chapter 2, Peter goes down and begins to identify false teachers for us and what false teaching really is. In verse 1, he says that some false teachers are going to deny the very master who saved them. They're going to deny Christ. Verse 2 tells us that they will lead many to follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. In other words, they're going to be powerful, influential preachers. They're going to have the ability to influence people and draw them into false teaching. Verse 3 says that they're just going to be greedy. In other words, they're motivated by money. They're motivated by greed. They're not motivated by love. They're not motivated for a cry for the souls of the lost. They're interested in the almighty dollar. Verse 10 and 11 reads this way, that they're proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. But angels who are far greater in power and strength do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those supernatural beings. In other words, demons and, and the devil is nothing but a joke, something to be scoff and laugh at. Verse 12 says that they're just creatures of instinct. In other words, this teaching and these, these teachers, it's all about emotion. It's all about, it's all about feelings. If it feels good, do it. If you don't feel any shame, if you don't feel any, any kind of remorse or regret or, or guilt, it's not sin. You just continue on and do it. Verse 13 tells us that uh, they sin in open daylight. In other words, if they're sinning in open daylight, there's, there's no shame, there's no guilt, but most importantly, there's no repentance. They're not repentant of their sin. They don't care. Sin's no big deal. Verse 18 says that the false teachers are going to actually lure people back into the same sins that they struggled with before they started worshiping the Lord. So this false teaching is actually, and these false teachers are going to teach people in such a way that they're going to get entangled and be held captive by the very sin that they turned away from when they gave their heart to the Lord. See, it's important to identify false teaching. It's important to identify false teachers. Now, this doesn't mean that we go around and every time we hear something and from someone that we don't necessarily believe that we start labeling them as false teachers. The Bible is very, very clear when you start reading about false teachers, what it defines as a false teacher. If you hear someone teaching anything that adds to or takes away from the requirements of salvation, it's a false teaching. No matter what they're teaching, if it adds to or takes away from the requirements of salvation, it is a false teaching. So what I want to do today is I want to take a few moments and I want to explain to you what false teaching truly offers. What it really offers because when you hear false teaching, it is going to offer you maybe a little more freedom. It's going to maybe be a little more comforting. It's going to be a little bit easier than maybe what you believe. But let me tell you something. What the false teaching and false teachers claim they offer, and what the Bible says they really offer, is many times two very different things. Many times, false teaching will offer you false freedom. 2 Peter 2, starting in verse 18, says that they brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting. With an appeal to twisted sexual desires, they lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. So Peter says that these false teachers, they brag about themselves. In other words, they're very proud. Now the Gnostics, what they taught was that the only way you could get spiritual revelation is if you were a Gnostic. 
So you could read the Bible all you want, you could study it all you want, but you would have no idea what it really taught unless you were a Gnostic. You believed what they believed. But Peter said that they promised this freedom, but in actuality, they were still just in bondage. They were held captive. See, the Gnostics were teaching people that you no longer lived under the law anymore when you gave your heart to the Lord. Now, to this point, they're right. We, we no longer live under the law. We, we don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to, to, to follow certain festivals. They were right, but then they took it a step further. And what they taught was no longer are you under the law, but also now there's no rules, no regulations. In other words, you give your heart to the Lord and you can live like the devil and all is well. But Peter says, this is a false teaching. This is just false freedom. In actuality, they're still held captive. Let's say that I start standing up here on a weekly basis and I start preaching to you that the only requirement for salvation is to come to this church. It doesn't matter how you live the rest of your life. It, it doesn't matter what you do. The only requirement for salvation is to come to this church for an hour every week. Now, to those living in this area, that's pretty sweet. Man, that's pretty liberating. A lot of freedom to that. Man, all I have to do is show up for an hour to church and I'm saved. This is great. This is awesome. But then what happens if you get this job opportunity? And so this job is, is tremendous. It's great. You've been hoping for it. In fact, you think that God has actually opened this door. But the problem is, is that the job's about a thousand miles away. Well, suddenly you're kind of conflicted. Suddenly, it's a little tough. You feel that Lord's opened this opportunity, but man, if, I, if you go a thousand miles away, then you can't come to church and you're going to go to hell. See, the doctrine at first gave you all this freedom. You felt that there was so much freedom, but in actuality, you were in complete bondage. Romans 6, starting in verse 1, says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Jump to verse 22. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification. The outcome? Eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me be clear. Any teaching or any teacher that teaches you you can live in open sin and live in open rebellion to God and still be saved is an absolute lie. It is an absolute false teaching. Paul said, the wages of sin is death. A spiritual death. The Bible teaches us that a relationship with Jesus gives us freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. See, false teaching many times will give you this false sense of freedom. But in actuality, what you will end up with is true captivity. 2 Peter 2 verse 20 says, And when people escape from the wickedness of this world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. See, we see that this false teaching will give you this false sense of freedom. And it's actually leading you into captivity. See, what Paul, Peter is saying here is if you turn your life to Jesus Christ, you've turned from the wicked world. So there's repentance in this line. There's repentance. They've turned from the wickedness of the world and followed the Lord Christ. Jesus. Know Him. But then they get entangled in sin again and go right back to what they were doing before. Peter says, you are worse off than you were before. 
Every once in a while, we'll, we'll read the news or we'll see the news of an escapee escaping from prison. And so if you put yourself in their shoes, here's this guy sitting in prison. And all he wants is freedom. He's stuck in this prison cell every day and all he longs for is freedom. And suddenly this day arrives where he sees this opportunity to escape. And so he takes it and he escapes from prison. And now he's free. He's free. He's finally found this freedom. But a couple days go by and he gets caught. And he goes right back to jail, right back into prison. Now the truth is, is that now he's worse off than he was before. Because now that he's gotten caught and put back in prison, now he's going to be charged with breaking out of jail, and now his prison sentence is, is going to be increased. Sin is a prison sentence. We are in prison when we are enslaved to sin, and we long for this freedom, and we give our heart to the Lord, and we find this freedom. We are free from sin. We are out of prison. But suddenly we get caught back up in that sin. We get entangled in that sin again, and we return right back to the prison cell we were before. And Peter says, you're worse off than you were before. 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 17, says, For the Lord is the Spirit. So wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord, who is the Spirit, get this, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. We are no longer slaves to human impulse. When you give your heart to Jesus Christ and you put your faith in Him, we are no longer enslaved to human impulse. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord resides in us and day by day by day we are changed into His glorious image. But here's the thing. This is the key. I can stand here and I can read these verses. I can use great illustrations and wonderful stories and I can, I can use as eloquent speech as I can. But you will truly not understand a relationship with Jesus and the transforming power until you experience it for yourself. Now, I want to be very clear. I am not saying that we base our salvation on experience. We base it on the Word of God. But this is what I'm merely saying. If I'm trying to explain to somebody what it's like to fall in love, I can read them poetry. I can read them stories. I can use a bunch of illustrations and, and life experiences and I can, I can do everything I can to explain to them how wonderful it is to fall in love. But they'll never truly know until they themselves experience falling in love. And suddenly when they experience that and they start to fall in love, all of those stories that were told, all of the poems, all of the illustrations, everything starts to make sense. Suddenly, you're, they, they all make sense, everything that's been told to them. See, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, and you've never experienced this life-changing relationship for yourself, make today that day. That is where you will find true freedom and escape from the captivity that the world offers. False teaching offers a false freedom that will lead you into captivity, but ultimately, false teaching will leave you with some very real consequences. 2 Peter 2, verse 21 says, It would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it, and then reject the commandment they were given to live a holy life. It's important to understand the context of this. Peter is not talking to some people on the side of the road who have never heard the gospel. He's not just randomly speaking to unbelievers and they've, they've recorded his words. He's writing a letter to a church. This church knew the Lord. They had a relationship with Jesus Christ, but some of them had turned their back 
and begun living in sin once again. And Peter tells them, listen, it would be better for you if you had never known the way to righteousness, Jesus Christ, than than to know him and turn your back and reject him. This word that we read that says no, it would be better for you if you had never known him. The word is epigonosco, which means to become thoroughly acquainted with or to know thoroughly. In other words, they knew the Lord. They had an intimate relationship. They thoroughly understood. They had a complete knowledge. In fact, verse 20 says that they escaped the wickedness of the world. So in other words, they repented. They turned from the wickedness of the world, knowing Jesus Christ, the same word, intimately knowing Jesus Christ. They turned from the world, but then they turned around and rejected him. And the Bible says that it would have been better for them to have never known him than to reject him. So what we're going to do is we're going to set a little foundation here. If it's better for them to have never known the Lord, then what's the consequence for not knowing the Lord? If it's worse for them, and it would have been better for them to never know the Lord, then what's the consequence of never knowing Him in the first place? Revelation 21.8 says this, But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The word translated as English, or in English as unbeliever, is the word apistus, which means without Christian faith. Plain and simple, the Bible is clearly stating that if you are an unbeliever, if you do not have your faith in Jesus Christ, you are going to go to hell. But what it is equally clear about is if it is better for you to have never known the Lord, which the consequence is hell, that it would have been better for you to never known Him than to know Him, but then reject Him. False teaching will lead to some very real consequences. I'm going to conclude here. There are those who teach that you can come and say a nice little prayer, you can give your heart to the Lord, and then you can live like the devil, and all is well. That is an outright lie. That teaching is giving you a false sense of freedom, which is holding you in captivity, which is going to lead to some very real consequences. But here's the thing. The Bible also teaches that if you follow the true gospel and you have a genuine relationship with Jesus, you will find true freedom. You will be taken away and escape captivity. And instead of looking forward to a consequence, you are going to be looking forward to a promise. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1, says, So now there is no condemnation for who? For those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, present tense, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of our weakness, of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body, just like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied. Listen to this. For us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. That promise that we just read has a condition. It is for us who no longer follow 
our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. With the gospel, there is freedom. With the gospel, there is a release from this captivity. There is an escape. And with the gospel, we don't fear the very real consequences. We look forward to the promise, the promise of eternal life with Christ Jesus our Lord. If I could have everyone stand. If I could have everyone bow their heads and close their eyes. If there's anyone here today who have heard this message and you have either never given your heart to the Lord or you have, but you're not very committed to Him right now. If that's you, I want you to lift a hand where you're at and I want you to say, whether you're here or at home, I want to commit or I want to recommit my life to Jesus Christ. I'm tired of being a slave to sin. I'm tired of being a slave to my human impulses. I want to be changed and transformed into the likeness of God. I want salvation where salvation can only be found in Jesus Christ. If that's you, just raise a hand and say it's me. Lord Jesus, we come before you today and Lord, you've placed this message on my heart for a reason. Lord, I believe even now that the Holy Spirit is speaking to those who have heard this. And God, I just pray that you would begin to speak to them. You would begin to to convict them, to draw them into repentance, to draw them into making this life-changing decision this very day. And God, I pray that those who are hearing this, who are making that decision today, Lord, I pray that you would transform them and you would change them. You would release them from the captivity they're in. You would deliver them from the sin that is entangling them. And God, I pray for freedom in their lives. Lord Jesus, I pray as the enemy comes back and attacks and tries to entangle them one more time, God, I pray that you would reveal truth to them and you would bring them into a, a close relationship with you and protect them. Lord, I thank you for every soul who is being added to the kingdom this very day from hearing this message. I thank you for every soul. May your kingdom be furthered. May your kingdom increase. And we thank you in your holy, wonderful name of Jesus. We pray it. Amen.